Fantastic. So, Bruce, are you going to get us started whenever you think the time is right? Uh, or I am prepared to do that. We're going to turn that over and, uh, when we're ready to start. Prusha, I think, has some introductions she wants to do. But I'm All certainly right. ready. Ar so, Arvind, ar we'll, we'll do what uh, Keith calls the facilitator whisper here. And, uh, and I will ask you out loud, uh, are we ready to start? I see the head this way. I think that's yes. So welcome I, everyone uh, to this event. Uh, I am Bruce Waltuck with the Plexus Institute and it is my pleasure to be able to help facilitate and run some of the Zoom stuff for everybody and, and help everybody out. And I, I believe my colleague and friend Prusha from Plexus has got some introductions and is gonna kick us off and then it'll go over to Armand and others. Uh, welcome everyone. Um, this is Plexus Conversations and our topic today is vital capacity and the prospects for thriving together. And the, uh, we have a terrific assortment of guests and you can see their bios on the screen. Um, uh, Bobby Milstein, Gary Gunderson, Dora Bahia, and you can see their brief bios on the screen and you can see more at the Plexus webpage, plexusinstitute.org. And um, I see these are brief bios, and we're going to turn it over to Arvind Singal, who's a professor at the University of Texas, and he has international appointments as well, and he's a veteran of positive deviance and liberating structures and entertainment education, and he's going to be our facilitator and moderator. So thank you, Arvind. All right. Thank you, Bruce and Prusha, and greetings uh, to all from New Delhi. As many of you know, a city in some anguish, uh, in a country that is in deep, deep uh, pain. Uh, every time the phone rings, it's uh, uh, an arbitrary uh, or news of somebody in the hospital. So please keep, keep sending all those love and compassionate uh, thoughts uh, our way over the uh, airwaves. And I know there are some of my friends here who have joined uh, from uh, New Delhi. Uh, there are some bios that are not uh, on the chat. And, you know, we have colleagues uh, like Larry McAvoy, uh, Jim Cochran, uh, Ella uh, Auchincloss. Ella, did That's I say right. that? That was a very, on the first try. Yes. Oh, you, well, you can go by my maiden name too, or Davila, but most people have All right. Or trouble with that. And, and so I guess when we get, uh, when we come to Larry or Ella or Jim, maybe they would say uh, a sentence or two about themselves. I think the participants would love uh, to hear it uh, from uh, them. Uh, to set the frame, uh, the container, uh, the common mindset uh, for this uh, session, I'm going to uh, rely on three people. Uh, you cannot go wrong with Mother Teresa. So first I'm gonna begin with Mother Teresa. Uh, she often used to say that none of us can do great things. None of us can do great things, but all of us everywhere at all times can do small things with great love. And in some ways, uh, that's a mindset uh, that may uh, help uh, uh, trigger some conversations uh, today. I'm also relying on Parker Palmer. Uh, I owe him a deep intellectual debt. I read his book, The Courage to Teach, uh, over a decade ago. It changed my life. Um, also his book, Let Your Life Speak. Uh, is uh, very relevant to our conversation today. And some of his most recent work, especially his book, Healing the Heart of Democracy, uh, is a very compelling uh, argument in which he basically says that the quintessential question for us as humans uh, today is not who we are, but whose we are. Not who we are, but whose we are. And Bobby, I think you may have a screen for the third uh, quote uh, that uh, 
will help guide this conversation. And perhaps before that, I should say that no one has done more uh, to create the conditions for us to thrive together uh, and to deepen the practice of shared stewardship, something that we talk about, uh, than the folks uh, who will lead our conversation today. Uh, their language, as you will hear, uh, of sh shared stewardship uh, looks at converting loss into renewal, uh, adversity uh, to strength. And to set the stage for that, here's this beautiful quote by Cynthia. And, uh, I let somebody else pronounce her last name, who says, we are here in this womb preparing for a new birth to bring forth something that is alchemized and made real by our willingness to get into the dance. To enter the dance, we must sacrifice the known for the power to see. And I perhaps am inviting Bobby uh, to the dance floor. We are going to engage in a framed interview. We think Bobby is a celebrity, so we call it a celebrity interview. I've learned this from Keith and uh, Fisher. But I think, Bobby, as I invite you to the dance floor, you want to begin with us watching a video. Uh, yes, I, I think we'll, we'll let this uh, set the frame for a discussion to come here. So. Um... Let me play this. Just two and a half minutes. America is a land of innovators and hard workers. Even in the face of enormous odds and challenges, we find ways to lift up the strengths and capacities of our people. That resilience is what has made us strong. And that resilience is once again being tested. We've inherited both just and unjust legacies. Some inflict harm and perpetuate exclusion. Others affirm dignity and grow inclusion. These inherited legacies shape the experience of our lives and whether we are likely to suffer, struggle, or thrive. Today, America is crying out in pain. Toxic forces from a series of compounding crises are destroying lives and tearing our civic fabric. The unfinished ideals of America are now our responsibility. It is our sacred obligation as Americans to work toward a more perfect union and to spring forward, turning this adversity into advantage, to make economic and emotional recovery possible, to share stories of how families and neighbors are supporting one another, to elect empathic leadership on both sides of the aisle and to make loud and resounding calls for equal justice. This is our defining moment. If we decide right now, together, that we will work from wherever we are to build, create, nurture, and sustain more just systems that advance our collective well-being, the future can come sooner than we think. Join us as we create new legacies predicated on one simple principle, all people and places thriving, no exceptions. Explore thriving.us to learn more about how your community can spring forward. Thank you, Bobby, for that video. And clearly, while the reference is to the United States, but no matter where you are, uh, whether in Germany or in France or the UK oh. or El Paso, uh, it speaks uh, to our local, regional, national uh, context. So Bobby, uh, one of the things that I learned from you in the first call we, we had 
was this statement which I carry with me very close to my heart. And that is that we grow in the direction of the questions we ask. And so I'm gonna ask you a few questions. Uh, and the first one is, you're talking about creating a new legacy, legacy of thriving together. And how did thriving together become such a prominent focus? You know, that, that quote about we grow in the directions of the questions we ask, it, I, I learned it from um, Otto Scharmer, who many people in this call may, may also know. Otto has is, uh, is, is got a, a great deep understanding about how we've become incredibly present to the circumstances that we're living in and still strive for transformative pattern changing, you know, uh, results. And, um, and, and Otto's work uh, in some ways fueled the aspiration for recognizing that even amid <clears throat> adversity, even amid intense loss would be the, the simplest way to gain the nature of the renewal that we're looking for is the experience of thriving. I think a lot of us know what it means to thrive. And sadly, we know also what struggling and suffering looks like. Uh, and there is immense, <laughs> immense suffering happening on a global scale at the moment, but still it is possible to aspire to thrive. Uh, and, and that's a fine statement for us as individuals, but we also could recognize that we are unique people in a common world. And what does it mean to thrive together? To really recognize our plurality and expect all people in all places thriving to get springboard work that we had sent um, as some advanced reading. But for me, that notion of thriving together um, represents the kind of creative tension that says we live in a world right now with lots of people struggling and suffering. It was never really built for all of us to thrive together, but that is still a direction that we can head. And um, I'll, I'll put up a little, a little quotation from Otto. You know, it, as systems collapse, people rise. And with systems collapsing on a spectacular scale, that's the source of resilience that I think a lot of us are looking to, to see that, that even a few people with a just cause can transform these failing systems for the better. And, and the guiding North Star expectation of thriving together seems to carry a lot of that aspiration that we've been hearing over and over again in communities across the US and around the world. So uh, Bobby, who is the we, uh, the WE yeah. that could achieve such a vast system change? Yeah, it's a, it's a it's a really good question. It's 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 hard sometimes to think about who does the work when we talk about system change. We also need to recognize the 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 hard work that it takes to break from business as usual and to do anything different. You started with the the idea that we are not ourselves necessarily. We belong to others, right? We 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 are part of a whose are we? Um, one simple answer is whoever shows up to do this work can be part of that we. Uh, there, there's a, a, a set of vital conditions that we have been thinking about that animate this work. And at the center of them is that sense of belonging and civic muscle that every, every human being, every living thing needs to feel that they're part of something bigger, right? We are interdependent in, a, in ways that are inescapable. Um, and it's not just that we belong, but also we have things to bring, that there are talents and capacities and cultures that can be brought together to solve problems and to do work that none of us could do alone. And so that animating force of belonging and civic muscle then expresses itself in what we can do to shape a thriving natural world and to assure that all people have the basic needs for health and safety, clean air and clean water and nutritious food and you know, routine you know, healthcare and, and also humane housing and meaningful work and wealth, lifelong learning reliable transportation. These are the, the basic you know, conditions for um, allowing people to be able to, to participate and prosper and reach their full potential. And so those, you know, the, the sort of work of springing forward even amidst adversity begins with every person um, who is able to expand the circle who feels that they belong and, and, and really build the civic muscle to allow us to do work that none of us could do alone. 
Bobby, for those of us who may say that it seems a little overwhelming to see one's own positionality uh, in this vast shared work, how do we find the strength to become better stewards? Yeah. Well, first, it's helpful to define the role, right? I mean, a lot of times it helps to have a word for things that, um, you know, that, that sort of distinguish the mindsets and actions of, of people and organizations. Until we had the word entrepreneur, it wasn't so easy to see what was that special drive of creative energy that allowed people to, to be doing you know, remarkable things in business or, or to migrate that word entrepreneur to social entrepreneur. But those people and organizations who see themselves immersed in a system that none of us fully understand, but still feel like we can be stewards of that system, um, right? I mean, our well being depends on a system designed long ago that was never built for all to thrive. And yet we can still act with clarity and intentionality, with courage to be, to step up and into roles as stewards. And, and so that's the beginning of this work is to see, um, we have a working definition of this that, that sort of identifies the, the basic commonality for anybody who steps into this work as taking responsibility with others in order to create the conditions that everyone needs to thrive and, and really beginning that work with clarity and, and solidarity with those who've been struggling and suffering. So anybody can be a steward. The issue is that this work of shared stewardship is so often unseen and uncelebrated. Um, our group at Rethink Health uh, last year um, interviewed a number of, of um, people and organizations who, who fit this definition, who see themselves as stewards of systems that shape our lives together. And it becomes very clear that the people doing this work are impressive and, and, um, and yet still very disconnected and disparate and, and frankly outmatched by the forces of injustice. And so a lot of, in many ways, this work is resting on uh, you know, our ability to come together and to step into roles that none of us were trained in or necessarily socialized in to play on, in our day jobs. But now our lives and our survival may turn on our ability to, to, to step into roles as effective stewards together, to expand those vital conditions and, and you know, create circumstances where all people need to thrive. Um, and that probably turns on as much internal capacities as it does on the work that we do in the outer world. How do we find the moral strength in ourselves? And how do we cultivate that sense of kindness and creativity in others and channel it toward this North Star expectation of people thriving. Um, that's was sort of the play on words for the title of this session was how do we, if, if our goal is to establish vital conditions in the world to thrive, we're going to have to find the vital capacities in ourselves to do this work. And that, that's, that's sort of the frontier of a lot of this inquiry that, um, that I hope we have today with, uh, with the colleagues assembled here. Well, let's invite uh, to the dance floor uh, to join in a fishbowl conversation, uh, uh, three other colleagues uh, who are uh, stewards uh, in the right sense of the word, uh, those who use language uh, to not just talk about uh, the leading causes of death or mortality, but who insist on talking about the leading causes of life, uh, Gary Gunderson, uh, Dora Berea, uh, uh, a, a steward par excellence, has a very compelling story. And my dear friend Larry McAvoy, uh, an emergency room physician uh, who uh, derives strength and inspiration uh, from uh, the ecology of biological systems and the natural world. So, Bobby, uh, you are of course, invited to join uh, the conversation as well. And I guess I turn it uh, over to the four of you and uh, uh, you may think of a talking stick and uh, begin, whoever, uh, Gary perhaps, or maybe Dora perhaps. Gary, why don't you go first? Yeah, I was afraid Dora would say that. <laughs> um, the um, so uh, two thoughts occur to me. The, we've alluded to the, the body of 
uh, thinking uh, around leading causes of life. And uh, Dr. Jim Cochran uh, facilitates, nurtures this, and sort of this as a steward of ideas. Um, but the ideas, what are they for? And why all these words? Uh, there's so much work to do, people to vaccinate, uh, people to feed, so much, so much practical work to do. Why all the words? And what we find is the need to uh, develop a stronger language that helps us become the people the world needs us to be. And um, in many cases, we have the same positional roles, but we find that many of the positions that we serve in were actually built around understandings of how important it was to fix something broken. And so we find ourselves in roles that actually don't fit the generative potentials, the, the vitalities we want to not just do, but live into. We want our lives to be about life. And very early on when <clears throat> Jim and TC and I, Heather, others here, were working on that, that body of language and asking what's it for and why that language? The language helps us become deeply accountable for the vital capacities that we find turn out to be universal. They're even in me and us, <laughs> they're, they're actually there. And so we need this better language to help us be deeply accountable for those capacities. And the second reason we need life language, not just functional, professional, do a better job language is uh, Dr. Paul Lorienti pointed out that you don't really need life language unless life is complex. Well, it turns out it is complex. And part of why I was uh, thrilled to see Bobby's graphic that emerged in this writing of the thriving document was the first time I'd ever seen a screen that actually had a lot of stuff on it about adversity on the same screen with a lot of stuff on it about vitality and well-being. And so it was a complicated slide, but it didn't quite bump all the way over to what a plexus crowd would say qualifies as complexity. And so what I'm eager for in this fishbowl in our conversation to help us be deeply accountable for playing roles that uh, help us live out of our vital capacities, but do so fully conscious of the radical complexity of what we're engaging. That's really what I was so eager. And I said, we just got to do this on Plexus <laughs> and in the Plexus tribe. Uh, they're the masters of complexity. Maybe we can bring this dialogue and the larger Plexus community can help us actually live into vital complexity. All right, Gary, I'll take the, the, the talking stick now. Um, thank you for s setting that up. I, well, I'm Dora Barula, and I want to share a little bit about my personal story because I think it sets the frame for my professional journey and um, a, perhaps a little bit of, of confusion that ca came to clarity much later on in my life. Um, I actually received my degree in sport over 30 years ago, received my degree in sports medicine. And it was actually in Malibu, California. And I think about how different my life would be had I had Bobby Milstein as an influencer versus some of the other people um, that, uh, you know, that lived in Malibu at the time. It probably would have been very different because, you know, when you get your degree in sports medicine, you're a physician, you're a physical therapist, you're an exercise physiologist. And I just really felt that None of that, I mean, I, none of it felt right. And so my first job, I was, a, I was the director of what we call preventive care and health education, which we refer to population health now in a large managed service organization. So this is managed care in the early 90s in Southern California. And my job was to really look at what we call frequent utilizers of, of services. And um, it was one Friday afternoon that I received a call from a physician just desperate saying, we need a, a certified diabetes educator. I have a stat health education call. I need somebody to come out. And I didn't have any 
uh, it, it, diabetes educators, they were all in the field. So I said, I'll come out. And I went out and as I was driving out to the physician's offices, I noticed that um, you know the, the sidewalks were pretty much non-existent. There was fast food everywhere. There was um, really an environment in, a, in an ecosystem that wasn't very healthy. And as I sat down and talked to this 16 year old who weighed 350 pounds, um, you know, I had my, I think it was the food pyramid at that time. And I was gonna tell her how, you know, she should exercise and eat right. And as I sat down and I listened to her, noticed signals of uh, physical, sexual and emotional abuse. And that girl literally changed my life. It was, you know, just really realizing that it needed so much more, that we really needed to look at this in terms of a shared ecosystem. We failed that young girl. Um, although she has forever been an influencer in her life, um, you know, I've been on a journey. I was in my early 20s at the time. Um, and in addition, I had, you know, I married a a paramedic who worked in the fire service. And so we've been married for 30 years. So we've had this dialogue of urgent services and the, the 911 calls to emergency department. And then, you know, my view of public health and prevention. And so it really, um, you know, pushed me in this journey of what, you know, whether it's vital conditions or ecosystems of getting my degree in public health, which I didn't even really know what that was a healthy communities movement, really looking at, you know, how can we with, um, you know, municipalities, faith-based organizations really come into a space where we can create healthier environments. Um, working with whole person care, um, really, um, you know, looking at the, the, the whole picture. I also founded a not-for-profit, you know, really looking at how can we have cross-sectoral partnerships. And you know, it's, I've, I've been amazed how continuously I've, you know, really felt, just as Gary said, not adequate in what I'm trying to do, that I've always, I've been in the healthcare system the majority of my career. And so 10 years ago, maybe a little bit longer, I met Gary. And when we, you know, with creating the tribe of health systems learning group, which we now call stakeholder health. And, and but what I found was, you know, there, there is a tribe of um, health systems all across the country that really want to lean into this work. And so stakeholder health is, you know, now a little bit over 10 years old. And it really is this loosely organized collaborative of more than 50 health systems of people that really want to you know, see the changes that I want to see, that they want to lean into and make healthcare more just, equitable, and effective. And how can we come together, you know, to convene to you know, support each other, to learn, to grow, and to you know, make things you know, in terms of the policies and what we're doing fundamentally different. And so um, I have, you know, uh, about a year ago, Gary had asked, or Gary and Jerry Winslow, who was one of my mentors, asked if I would lead stakeholder health. And, you know, as we really started having conversations again deeply with, um, you know, the health systems, COVID hit. And, um, you know, really see this moment of just immense suffering and loss and getting back to, you know, how can we have adversity into strength, saw this moment in time and this opportunity to really look at shared stewardship that we, you know, how can we come out of this creating that, um, you know, that really that, that shared vision, um, the shared learnings and do something fundamentally different. And I'm in my you know, second half of my career and in January, I stepped away from the third largest health system in the country you know, to really lean into how can we do this differently? How can we work with other sectors? How can we um, really make a difference? So I'm, I'm here today to be a part of the fishbowl and to connect with all of you and to learn and, and thrive together. So I'll hand it over to my colleague, Larry. Uh, hey, Larry, we may need a uh... little uh, generative feedback from my friend Arvin. Thank you. Um, that was the best thing I was going to say the whole time, and I have no idea what it was. Um, I just want to thank Gary and Dora both um, and everyone else on the call 
one of the most wonderful things to me about the last 12 months, which is we've all had our stories of difficulty as well as um, sort of uh, as uh, Bobby talked about Otto's comment that when systems collapse, people rise. I think we've seen both of those poles of that statement in the last 12 months. One of the things I found most invigorating, I don't like sitting in front of screens. Um, I'm an emergency physician and I, I'm used to roaming, right? Room to room, person to person. Um, I'm used to roaming on land. Um, and so I don't like to sit down, but when I open up these computer screens and see all the faces from so many different places and walks of life um, and so many conversations, so many different languages, so many different areas of interest, I'm reminded of what I heard in that video, right? Which is that diversity is an advantage. Um, I have a bias like everyone else does. Um, I probably would, I love that vital conditions model as a person who's sort of steeped in biology, I might draw it a little bit differently, but that's a conversation about models somewhere. One of the things I'm interested in lately is this idea of infection. Um, as I've worked in the emergency department and considered my life as a recovering healthcare CEO and as a person who takes care of a piece of land that we um, agreed to steward 25 years ago when it was badly damaged from at least 80 years of abuse and was on land that had been uh, a mere five, six generations ago populated with bison and indigenous people, um, certainly had a lot of room to think about these things. Um, and probably like all of us have felt often very small and wondered, you know, how does this happen? And along comes this coronavirus, right? Um, as I like to say, no business plan, no name, no Twitter following, no social station, no spot in a box. It is literally anonymous nothing on a planet that has all of these, what do they say? Um, compounding crises. And yet it moves fluidly, floridly, right? All across the earth. Um, we ignore it, it moves. We panic, it moves. We argue, it moves. And so, um, you know, I was thinking a bit um, lately, what are the pathogens that allow us to thrive together? What social infection actually allows us to become generative within each of us, between any of us, and across all of us? Is that possible? And the pandemic would suggest yes. I mean, we may not like the pandemic, right? It's a icky packet of, of uh, you know, RNA single strand virus or whatever its construct is, but it's unbelievable in its power to captivate our communities and to run through them and in them. And so is there, is there a flip side is one of the, one of the things I've been thinking about, um, you know, to Bobby's point about stewards are kind of rare and amazing and unseen and unnoticed which is in a way what I like about stewards, right? We're not into ego. Stewards are people that are willing to be anonymous at one level. Um, I remember years ago an emergency, or in the ER, a, a woman asked me as I was sewing her daughter's face, her daughter had been jumped by a gang and, you know, her daughter couldn't speak because her mouth was all hamburgered. And uh, so her mother and I had an interesting conversation for about an hour while I was working on this young woman and she told me her daughter was most worried about going to the prom which is about six weeks later and i as I, we were talking she said why do you do this and, and i remember asking her like what do you mean why do i like to sew faces that are you know lacerated and disfigured why do i do this job why this specialty why here why now lovely woman and she said any of it really like why are you here and i remember um you know sort of in that nice fugue we get into when we're kind of on autopilot in one zone and our mind can wander freely. I told her, I said, really, someday, uh, maybe next month at the prom, but someday this young person's going to get married or have a child or, you know, celebrate her own child's wedding or whatever else. And in these moments, we would like her to be happy and not remember us, right? That her focus shouldn't be on us. And uh, she ended up writing me a, a thank you note about two and a half months later. She wrote a, a, a hand-drawn, line-drawing card. It was really nice. And um, she included a picture of her daughter with her prom date. And she said, you know what? She didn't think a word. She didn't have a single thought about you all night long, which was great, right? So that to me is, that's, that's, those are the millions of tiny things that happen every single day 
in stewardship, right? And so is it possible, I think, to create an infection of stewardship? I think we do have what I would call the dominion pathogen. I call it acquisition, convenience, and gratification, that when people orient around those things, eh, we kind of create some bad stuff, right? Not that any of them are bad. If you don't have a shirt and you're cold, acquiring one is a good idea. So what is the what does the stewardship pathogen look like? I think it's contribution, connection, and gratitude. And so as I look at biology, my native language, and I would argue the operating system of this planet and all living things, driving together to me means finding a way for people to be able to relate anywhere, anytime in an experience that they find, I would call it generative or fruitful, the language gets in our way here to Gary's point. Um, and in my whole life, I mean, whether people were beaten or shot or they were in an organization where things weren't going well, the ability to relate is always in some way something people can migrate toward. They're attracted to, they, they come into it. Um, you know, Keith and Fisher do this uh, so well with the liberating structures, right? I mean, People want metrics, they want results, they want things to shift. But really, when you go down to the tiniest of things, if we redesign the way we relate, then thriving starts to happen at this infinitesimal thriving level. And somewhere in our brains, we go from acquisition, convenience, and gratification, a defensive, aggressive, power-seeking posture to, you know what? I want to connect. I want to be part of. I want to listen. I want to understand. And... That shift in our brain times 7 billion people, five minutes a day would be amazing, right? 10 minutes a day would be amazing times two. So just some random thoughts. Um, I, I'll go back on mute now. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's incredibly um, gratifying to hear the common thread across all three of those, which, which is in some ways large and small, a pivot from sort of recognizing the illusion of separateness and how it shows up in our work to creating experiences of interdependence, right? Even small experiences of interdependence can draw more people into this work and cause us to, to you know, uh, be participants and uh, sort of partial co-creators of something bigger than ourselves. Uh, so that's at least one thing I heard from those three comments really quickly. But back to you, Arvind. Terrific. Now we can keep going on. This is uh, such a gift uh, to have uh, the likes of Gary and Dora and Larry and Bobby and you know these conversations can continue. However, I'd like to break out uh, metaphorically of this fishbowl and wanted to invite uh, Ella uh, as a sort of a, you know uh, call yourself a respondent, a reflector. Uh, thank you. Thank you, everyone. Um, Ella Auchincloss. I work with Bobby at Rethink Health and the Ripple Foundation. Um, my title is the Director of Enterprise Innovation, but um, I sort of view my work as trying to operationalize a lot of the great ideas that Bobby and Gary and the likes of all of you come up with. Um, a couple of things I heard that I'm reflecting on, I think a lot about complexity in our work. And I think a lot about how to design work for complexity. And I think a lot about how organizations are really designed for complicated work. And I, I also think about leadership and how leadership is designed for complicated work. And um, I think this idea of complexity requires a very different consciousness, um, human consciousness. And at the heart of it is around um, being able to hold two ideas as true at the same time. The idea of being able to navigate polarity, the idea of um, looking for that unit, unit of field. So I really see the vital capacities of stewards and stewardship um, I think what we need to start doing is naming those teachers, those bodhisattvas who've come to us throughout human history that have taught us what it means to go below and to hold two things as true at the same time. Because 
as long as we're not doing that, then we can't hold the enormity of what it means to be a steward. And so in our work, we think a lot about how do we, yes, design tools and methods and help them see the system in a different way. But Cynthia Bourgeau, the, the, the person who said the quote at the beginning of the session to me is a, a wonderful example of a teacher who is really trying to build that vital capacity that enables us to hold these um, complex ideas at the same time to be able to navigate those tensions. And I think the other thing I, I, I heard, it wasn't said, but I, Bobby reminded me that someone said at some point in the last 14 weird months that COVID-19 is the, if you wanna learn about interdependence, if you wanna teach about interdependence, you need to look no further than the story of this uh, pandemic as the ultimate exercise in that. And so um, I'm a learner. Um, I'm, I'm a student in interdependence like all of you. That's, that's what I'll say for now, Arvind. Thank you, Ella. I'm just uh, pointing out that one of our super, super mentors, uh, Henry Lipmanovich is on the call, welcome Henry. And over to Jim now, uh, Jim Cochran. Uh, Jim, I wonder if you wanna reflect on what's been said, uh, what you've heard, what you'd like to add. Uh, thank you, Arvind, and thank you everyone else. <coughs> I will keep it short. Um, uh, a couple of things, uh, there's a lot of fascinating and rich stuff there that I don't want to simply reiterate. So let me add a couple of things that maybe haven't been emphasized uh, that uh, have been hinted at. Um, one, one is um, the common thread that you've seen, Bobby and Ella, you've just talked about uh, interdependence, uh, dependence, coming together, connection, um, and so on. The way in which COVID has helped us understand that. Um, there's a side to that that also enables us to treat our connections as exclusive, uh, that can actually be harmful, that um, if you like, um, the uh, critical question that seems to me uh, we are needing to focus on just as strongly is toward what ends? Uh, we can do all of this to different kinds of ends, and they're not necessarily all about thriving. They're not necessarily uh, thriving just for, for, for everyone, but only for some and harmful for others. Um, in short, uh, I would say that part of what we have to focus on, which is key to also what we talk about in the leading causes of life circles, is um, the vital capacities are not just skills or tools. They are actually what's at the core of what it means for us to be human in our ability to look at actuality, to see new possibilities in it, and to transform that actuality uh, in the process. That's an extraordinary set of capacities we have. It's why we have planes and computers and zooms. Um, but it's also why we can destroy this planet should we so choose. And um, it's also why we can decide to trash a constitution or tell the big lie or not to do so in order to bring certain people into our orbit. Uh, it's in my reading, uh, the particular kind of interdependence that's being promoted in the country you're in at the moment, uh, Arvind, uh, by the prime minister is a highly destructive form. Um, uh, it's certainly drawing a lot of people, but that doesn't mean it's thriving. I don't want to focus on the negative. What I'm really trying to deal with is uh, to say that these capacities to transform both nature, which is partly why we are able to deal with COVID and uh, uh, through vaccines that were almost unthinkable uh, even a year ago, uh, we are also able to transform our relations with each other. And we can do so. Nothing we have built together is not being done in that way. Nothing we do together has not been done by people rising when systems collapse and building new systems, whether it's on a small scale or a large scale. The critical issue is towards what ends, for whom, how inclusive and how exclusive, including nature. Jim, thank you. 
we of course want to hear from you as well. And so the next uh, part of uh, our conversation uh, will put you in uh, small little uh, breakout rooms. And Bruce, thank you for your willingness to help us out with that. So uh, for the next uh, five minutes or so, you would find yourself in a group of four and uh, you can roughly decide how much time uh, you'd have. Uh, but we'd love to hear from you uh, and the invitation to you is the following. Uh, what do you wish to be a steward of? What are you most passionate about? My son, for instance, who's in Dallas is planning a 400 mile march for racial and economic justice and for climate change. And that's gonna end at Ted Cruz's house. <laughs> providing a little, uh-huh. Uh, and uh, so I know he wants to be a steward of that. So what do you wish to be a steward of? And where do you find uh, the vital capacities uh, to thrive with others? Those are the invitations, uh, interpret them in whichever way you want. And Bruce, over to you, breakout rooms, five minutes, four people each. Uh, don't be bashful, go into the flow. And thank you, Arvind. I have that ready to go. And uh, hold on, folks. We're about to go to the breakout. Enjoy the conversation together. Hey, Bruce, like you, uh, yes. I am have, so we, happy. We, we have gone breakout together. I love it. <laughs> <laughs> it's all random, but it was meant to be. <laughs> it was. It was. How nice. Well, thank you for all your help. And this is, you know, it's such a, I mean, the intellect and the heart uh, that one sees uh, on, on this call is uh, uh, very noteworthy. I would certainly agree. And, and when I first saw the, the uh, text and the information about this event, there were so many things about this that resonated with me. I'm not a healthcare professional, but I actually spent two years as a senior advisor for process improvement to the head of the federal agency that deals with substance abuse prevention and treatment and behavioral health or mental health services, $3 billion a year in grants. And, and I learned so much about this and, and happened to be at the time that they were crafting the Affordable Care Act. And of course, they asked the one person who's not a health professional to write the agency's position paper on health care reform. So uh, I got quite an education with that. And there's so much here about thriving and connecting and the dynamics of networks and where we find people. Um, so the question, you know, the framing question for the four of us here about what do we want to be stewards of? I know for me, my answer is I want to help people get to better outcomes together. And that's, that's kind of the little phrase that, that I have used for a long time. Um, there are ways that we can invite people and include people and facilitate dialogue, whether it's with liberating structures or strategic doing or any of these methodologies. And so to me, it's about finding those people through open invitation, you know, inclusive and welcoming, not exclusive and judgmental. To me, those are critical factors. Well said, Bruce. Uh, Bruce, may I request you for a small procedural um, uh, task? I know you have the capability of broadcasting messages. I think uh, I do. Yes, I do. I have that window open right now. <laughs> So basically to say, and I think what we've got a couple of minutes, I don't know how much time. Oh, we've just there's... gotten started. We can give them a little time if you like. I know okay. we're close. We're theoretically yeah. close on time, but we're okay. Okay. So I guess the, the, in the broadcast message, you could say that if each group could agree on 
well, they don't need to agree. If each <laughs> group, if one representative from, uh, or maybe the invitation is to everybody, uh, if you wish to come back, go to chat and uh, type out no more than a sentence, uh, which you think is worth sharing uh, with uh, the larger group. We certainly want to invite that. And I'm forgetting, um, what was the intention on the design board, again, using the, uh, the facilitator's whisper to you here, uh, was yeah. the intention on the design board to do a chat waterfall to capture those yes. afterwards? That's what I that thought. That is correct. That's that is what correct. I thought. Very good. I will, I will send that message right now. Great. Thank you, Bruce. Pleasure. Of course. And in the meantime, let's hear from Rosalie and Shingai. Shingai, yeah. Rosalie and Shingai, if you are here, we'd love to hear from you. Uh, so Bruce, we are doing okay on time. I think we started about uh, five or seven minutes uh, past the noon hour. Yep. And yeah, so we're doing great. We're doing great. You're doing great on time, yeah. And forgive me, I'm just typing in that message to get out to everybody. Yes, please. There's a there's a limit on the size of these messages. It turns out, <laughs> yeah, it's a, like a Twitter feed. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So now I have to edit. <laughs> okay, there we go. There we go. Okay, broadcast is done. <laughs> oh. Excellent. Perfect. To our other two wonderful guests here with us right now, what 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 do you make of all this? What's what's this whole idea of stewarding these kinds of conversations to get these kinds of objectives? What does that mean to both of you? There's no right or wrong answer, so just jump in with whatever you want to say. Shingai and Rosalie. I wonder if they also were signed up um, through maybe their mobiles or if they are already in, uh, you know, sometimes some of us have. So yeah, it seems uh, our friends are silent and we feel their presence anyway. We do indeed. And I see that Shingai is not muted. Uh, Rosalie is. Um, right. You know, don't be bashful if you'd like to, uh, to, to chat and tell us a little bit about yourself doesn't have to necessarily be about stewarding uh, these kinds of vital things for thriving or, or, you know, you could talk about whatever you want to talk about. What's the weather like wherever you are in the world right now? I don't know. And Arvind, I don't know about you, but this is an awful lot like teaching my students online this last semester. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, some of my students are on this call. I mean, you know, they're, yeah, just... Uh, uh, I finished my for I finished my last class this morning. Oh, I have New my Delhi last Delhi. final tonight. <laughs> okay, okay, got it, got it. Getting yeah. there. And uh, Bruce, how are we doing on time? I for we, some we're going to give them. A, I think we're give them another minute or two, and uh, okay, I'm gonna I'm okay. gonna send a message out that we'll get them back in in two minutes. Okay, and uh, then you know we'll run a couple minutes over, like you said, but we started a little after the hour, yeah. so yeah. okay, that's all good. And there we go. And Bruce, the class that you are teaching at Keen, uh, it's yeah. uh, a class on, uh, is it social entrepreneurship? 
It, it is. Um, uh, I, I've been teaching that for a couple of years, and I also teach every semester. I teach a class in negotiation, and mm -hmm. I bring complexity concepts um, in, into into. It's interesting. In in, um, in 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 four years, I have taught six different courses, <laughs> um, and and I'm always teaching one. I teach negotiation every semester, but. Six out of seven semesters, I've had I've had different classes. And it's like here's a 700-page textbook. You got three days. Go get ready. You know. Um, at any rate, yes, I teach commercial and social entrepreneurship and uh, other other kinds of marketing and management classes. And I bring complexity concepts to just about all of it. Um, what has especially resonated with me is the field of social entrepreneurship. Uh, it didn't occur to me when I first began to look into the text and the literature and the work, that complexity is a literal challenge and, and issue in that particular kind of entrepreneurship and work, um, both in terms of assessing the social landscape, the ecosystem of where the people in a community are having a social problem or need, whether it's homelessness, hunger, and you know, whatever it is, um, and then at the other end of, of the, the line of work of the social venture, assessing impact is extremely difficult. We can count the number of people that we can bring into a shelter or feed, but the broader impact, I know one of the first case studies we do is a wonderful case study from India. It's a company called Akar Industries. Mm -hmm. And they were helping women get hygiene products at an affordable price in rural towns and villages all over India, um, where, where the dominant product was by Procter & Gamble and cost 40% more. Most women couldn't afford it. Mm, mm, there were mm. secondary cons. So they used micro financing to create jobs and small businesses, make these women mm. the, the business owners and produce the stuff. So it created jobs and income. You could count that easily for outcomes mm. and impact. But mm. there were secondary impacts, which is that young girls who otherwise had to drop out of school because they couldn't be healthy or have the hygiene products they needed, now we're able to stay in school mm -hmm. and complete their education. Mm -hmm. So how do we assess that impact and value in, in, in a community and society? How do we assess happier families, happier towns, happier people, yeah. healthier people? So, yeah. and, and it turns out that there is a small but growing, and Heather, welcome, hi. You've got about a, about a minute to, to join us and jump in here. Okay, thank you. So Good what would you, you like Heather. to tell us about, about, about this concept? What do you want to steward? Oh, I seem to have ended up with you rather than the main group. But what I want to steward is a change in the mindset. And I take issue with the assumption that we are by default overwhelmed by the broken systems. In every community, you find invisible heroes and you find people who are dedicated to life and the leading causes of life. So I would say it's wrong to assume that we are all overwhelmed or that those of us who work in some way as stewards um, are hampered by that perception. Uh, in our daily lives, we don't look to the big broken systems. We look to our neighbors. I see we've got some folks jumping in with us and I'm not sure quite if we're, if we're heading back to, to the main thing, but Arvind, I'm gonna go ahead and close all the rooms and get us please. back at this point. Please, please. We just decided to join you. Well, that's okay. <laughs> we're joining everybody right now in, in one minute. Awesome. <laughs> we couldn't wait to get back. That's okay. We couldn't wait to see you. <laughs> Um, we were just hearing a comment from Heather that, you know, that may be wrong to say that, you know, that that there's that everything is kind of broken and that and on this and that and 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 that there's always local champions, local heroes who are willing and able to steward stuff. And and Heather, I certainly agree with that statement. I know from my my learning from um, Deborah Fries and Margaret Wheatley. You may or may not be familiar with a book they wrote called "Walk Out, Walk On." Yes. Wonderful stories. You know, and, and the whole idea of asset-based development and uh, what's called bricolage, what can I do with who and what I have, where I am without any other help from anybody. And there are absolutely these champions and these heroes and these connectors and all of that for sure. 
Well, and certainly in the lockdown, we are seeing people be enormously creative in Very nice. working around their desperation. Uh, right across from me is a wonderful young family, um, two little kids. And as soon as lockdown began to hurt everyone economically, into the family came another family with three little kids. So now they cooperate, they live together, they share babysitting, they share the education because our schools are still closed. So they're being very, very creative in this period of hardship. So I wouldn't underestimate people at all. And I just wanted to uh, welcome everyone back to the main, uh, the main gathering. And we hope that you had really rich and vibrant and productive and generative dialogue. Um, what you were just hearing was a quick comment from Heather in our little breakout uh, as we came back uh, with some thoughts about you know, um, the idea that there are champions and heroes and connectors um, everywhere that we go in the world. And, and we can seek these local people. Uh, you know, you may know positive deviance. That's another kind of related practice and thought. And at this point, I'm going to turn it back over to Arvind to uh, ask us about doing the so-called chat waterfall of what you all were thinking about. Well, something that I learned from uh, Fisher, my mentor. So the invitation to you, if you wish to accept, uh, is to go to chat uh, and, you know, with your fingertips, uh, 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 perhaps uh, uh, type out a sentence uh, which you think just absolutely needs to be shared uh, mm -hmm. with the group based on mm -hmm. the conversation that you might have had. And we ask you to hold off on hitting return. Uh, you can hit return when we say hit return, maybe after a minute. I'll ding my tingsha bells if I find them. <laughs> Uh, and uh, then we can see a waterfall. You know, we'll save the transcript and send it to you. So the invitation is yours, uh, a minute uh, to go to the chat function and share with us uh, a sentence uh, that you think others would find meaningful. Mm. So type it in, but don't hit enter until Arvin gives you the signal. Mm. Still on. Yeah, for a little bit longer. Wrap it up in about five minutes. I know we started about 10 minutes late, so. Mm. Give another 10, 15 seconds. So don't hit enter yet. It's coming. The Tingsha bells are. Oh, he's got, he's got the bells of destiny right there. The nature <laughs> of the bells is to ring. Hmm. So let's do I love that. Beautiful. All right. Oh, oh, oh. Drowning. <laughs> Completely drowning. Beautiful. Thank you. Well, as and you, you know, you may look at the chat waterfall. I wish we could read each one of them uh, collectively, but perhaps we wouldn't do that. So, uh, Bobby, how about we sort of uh, close this, uh, bring it together? And uh, there's a beautiful statement that you made, uh, which I think I'm going to use to invite you to close the session. Uh, and that is, how do we provide? hospice to a dying culture and become midwives to a rising future. Uh, we, uh, <clears throat> like, like, like all good <laughs> generative experiences, we didn't really know what would come up from this session, but it, it, did seem, it did seem likely that we would wanna look at both the micro experiences in, in moments and the ways that we interact. And we've heard a lot about that in, in our own lives, as well as 
the grand stage of what's happening. Your question about, you know, there, there is a pattern of working together now that isn't working well at all, having, having you know, really dire consequences for ourselves and the planet. Mm -hmm. and, and, and yet there is still this hope. And, and so we thought about ending with, with um, a, you know, sort of a story about three horizons that there is, yes. you look at what's popular now, the current norms and the mindsets and practices that uphold business mm -hmm. as usual. That's dominated by a pattern of fragmentation, the illusion of separateness, the, mm -hmm. you know, sort of comfort, at, if you will, with social division and the idea that everybody does their part and somehow it's going to work out well, but it, it never does because everybody's externalizing the things that, that most matter to us. And so that mm -hmm. pattern of fragmentation is, is popular at the moment, but we could say it's misfit for purpose. It, 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 it would have to decline for something new to arise. And, and so, you know, the hospice to the dying culture is something about our tendencies toward fragmentation. Um, hmm. the, 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 you know, the, 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 the opposite extreme is this deep appreciation for interdependence and, and, you know, all the way to what Jim was saying of, you know, not just that we're interdependent and we could use that interdependence for good or ill, but interdependence, like, like our lives are dependent on each other's. If we hurt another, we hurt ourselves. If we hurt our planet, we hurt ourselves that level of interdependence probably leads the way to a viable future, but it's so outside the norm at the moment. It's not that it's not there. It's just mm -hmm. deeply uncommon and marginalized. And yes, you know, we, we've heard this from centuries of indigenous communities that think we know how to live together in a finite world, but, but that's been displaced and disrespected and, and, and alienated. Um, in between the two is, you know, could be the path to bridge, you know, take our, our individuality and, and forge it together through shared stewardship. If we could build that kind of strength, then maybe we could be a path toward the kind of interdependent future that we're looking for. And mm -hmm. so this, this thought that we don't have to, yes. you know, dismiss everything about the world as it is to start anew, but we can remake it moment by moment, place by place, organization by organization through the mm -hmm. process of shared stewardship. And, um, you know, our, our organization has been thinking a lot about what is, what, what does it take to strengthen shared stewardship? We listen really carefully to those that say they want to do it and are in the throes of trying to build the mindsets and skills. And the closest that we've come to, and you're, the Plexus audience is, there is no better audience on the planet to see a, a crazy formula like this. But, but I, I, I hope you'll take it in the spirit with which we're offering it, which is you know, a little heuristic to think about the main mm -hmm. elements of stewardship. Each of us as individuals and as organizations have this capacity. The question is, how deep is that practice? Are we really living up to the, you know, the the, the deep love that that um, Mother Teresa was talking about that Arvind called us into um, today's session with? That deep practice goes really, really deep, and most of us are only scratching the surface. Um, and then it gets exponentially more powerful when when animated by our strong relationships. Even one relationship um, can can really expand into many more possibilities. And so mm -hmm. deep practice powered by yes. strong relationships and then multiplied by our ability to fit into the conditions that we find ourselves. There's no such mm -hmm. thing as, as, you know, uh, as enabling or opposing conditions. It's a question of how do we show up as stewards in those conditions and meet the complexity that we find. Sure, mm -hmm. there's, you know, climate catastrophe and overt racism and, and, and you know, the remnants of economic uh, uh, you know, uh, sort of shareholder capitalism, but all of those mm -hmm. are for stewards to transform and meet in one way or another. And so yes. those are the conditions that lead to the prospects of thriving together. Um, this is a, a formula we're holding lightly, but it seems to work across scales. And it seems to be a kind of thing that each of us, you know, can first and foremost look to ourselves and say, how am I acting like a steward and then calling other people into this work as well? Mm -hmm. So we leave us all with this as a thought um, that we're beginning to, to, to question, you know, can this be the way to build a skill that, that really all of us possess, but none of us can practice alone? Beautiful. Bobby, it's uh, music to uh, listen uh, to you. Uh, mm -hmm. And uh, uh, it's, highly inspirational and generative. We began with Mother Teresa, why not end with His Holiness, the Dalai Lama. I was once in an audience with him when somebody asked him, 
how do we treat the other? No, I mean, it's a profound question. And he laughed and his response was, what other? Mm. So Beautiful. thank you all. Mm. Thank you all for that was good. joining on this call oh, from man. near and so far. Good. And so good. Oh, oh, Nicole, look at that heart sign you've got. Oh, yes, 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 yes. Love it. So I think if you wish, we can uh, open our microphones and have a symphony or a cacophony of uh, uh, greetings or, you know, shout outs. Mm. Uh, but I just uh, want to thank uh, mm. our dear participants. Uh, thank you, Bobby, for leading us, uh, Gary, uh, Dora, and Larry, uh, for deepening our conversation, Ella and Jim, for your deep reflections, and to each one of you uh, for, mm -hmm. uh, for doing your small little thing with great love. Thank you, Arvin. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Bye. 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 Great. So great. Hey, Lydia. To good to see pleasure. you. So great. Hey, Henry. Looking good. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Yeah. I feel very lucky to Thank have been a part of it. Thank Future you. of teachers. I feel very grateful to have been asked to help you all out today. Oh, Bruce, you, were, you were the master behind. I mean, you know, if we were puppets, you were the puppeteer. And uh, <laughs> I don't know about that. I'm just a guy who knows maybe a tiny bit more than somebody else knows. And that's, that seems to be enough. So <laughs> I'll be a great job. Great. Thank you all. Yeah. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, Prusha, for putting this bye together. Bye. Yeah. Thank, Thank you, Prusha. Thank, Thank you, everyone. Arvind, everyone, all of our guests and speakers. Thank you all for doing this. Wonderful. And Corey. And thoughts. Hey, hey. Thank you, Dr. Singel. Thank you, Gary. All right. Thank you, everyone. It was an amazing session. All right. Thank you. Uh, Thank send you. The, send, the again. send the video. We might be able to bye find bye. a for that. Yes. Uh, Bruce, Thank you did you. record it now, so we'd love it to. It is recording. Um, I'm going to I'm going to yeah. stop the recording now, and then it's going to take a little while to do its thing and perfect resolute itself into yeah. the cloud or wherever it goes. I have no idea perfect. where it goes. <laughs> well, Marvin, <laughs> safe travels tomorrow. I hope your mom makes it. <laughs>